Hey, I've got two questions for you today. The first is, is there anything in your life that's confusing right now, that's foggy, that's uh, perplexing you? Maybe you've got a big decision to make or a complex problem that you're working through. Second question, is anything afflicting you? And maybe these go together, but is there in any way that you are under a profound burden, a heavy burden? Affliction is the word that the psalmist use uses. I'm going to speak to these two things today. Confusion, affliction. That's the topic of today's episode of Growing in the Gospel. And really, it's God's Word that's going to speak to us. I'm Pastor Kerry. Thanks for joining me. We are on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of every week, slow walking through the Psalms. And we are right now in Psalm 119, which is the longest chapter in the Bible. And we're picking it up today in verse 65. So I do invite you to join me there. There's other things we're doing on the channel. We're going through the book of Revelation. We're going through the book of John. And we're doing the one-year Bible journey on Mondays and Tuesdays. All of this is available on the playlist. And so I hope that you will um, take advantage of this material. And so glad to hear from all of you. So those of you that post comments or express gratitude or uh, say how a, a particular devotional has challenged or changed or helped you through a moment. <clears throat> I just rejoice in that and I'm so thankful to hear from you. So today, what do you pray when you're confused? This So much of this psalm is a prayer. In other words, it's voiced to God. So it is um, really uttered from the heart of a follower and crying out, Lord, teach me, grow me, change me. I'm holding to your word. I'm making my decision. And uh, and so we, we are really listening in to a prayer. And remember, this is an alphabet song. So when you come to verse 35, you see the first word is this Hebrew letter, tet. Okay, and that really is just the next letter in the alphabet. And like I've said before, all the eight verses here began with the letter tet in Hebrew. doesn't quite translate that way into English, but that was the intention of the original author. So let's pick it up in verse 65 and let's look at what this servant of God, this follower of God prays when he's confused or when he's afflicted. So verse 65, thou, this is where the prayer is. This is aimed at God. Thou hast dealt well with thy servant. Now I want to comment here because we're going to get into some chastening. We're going to get into some hardship And yet looking back, now this is cool because this is a a retrospective. We're looking back on the hardship. Have you thought recently that there's going to come a moment in your life when you're looking back on your hardship? You're going to be looking back on it. And if you journey through it the right way, and I, you know, as a pastor, one of the hardest things is to watch people you love go through hardship and not really have any power to change it or to resolve it or fix it. I read a thing not long ago. I'm going to share it with the church family sometime soon. It was uh, written by a lady, and I can't forget her name, but basically the the tone of the essay was, if it were up to me, I would have taken Joseph out of the pit, and I would have lifted him out of prison, but I would have been robbing Israel from their food and salvation from the famine. And if it were up to me, I would rescue, you know, and you just go down through the the line of Bible history all the way to the cross. If it were up to me, I would have taken Jesus and rescued him off the cross, but I would have cheated humanity from having a savior. The point of the essay was that we want to get out of turmoil rather than go through it, journey through it by the grace of God, trusting that he's doing something really big. And This strengthens our faith when we come to verse 65 and read a psalmist saying, I have gone through affliction, I've gone through chastening, I've gone through difficulty, I've had enemies reproach me and lie against me, but God's dealt well with me. You know, if you trust God and don't give up on him, and if you're not trying him out, you know, like, like, uh, like a new pair of shoes, and if he doesn't fit, you're gonna cast him off. No, I mean, if you wholly, Commit yourself to the Lord. You build your life on the rock of his salvation and the rock of his truth. You will one day look back on your whole journey, all of the good and the bad, all of the highs and the lows. You will look back on all the difficulty and you will be able to testify. The Lord's dealt well with me, his servant. I love how 
the defining term. You know, who am I? I am his servant. I am God's servant. Reminds me of Mary when she said, be it unto me, behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. So I just love this first phrase. Thou hast dwell, dealt well with thy servant. You say, well, he hasn't dealt well with me. The story is still being written. Your faith is still being forged. God is on the march. He's doing something, and he's going to work together all things for good. So you hang on to that faith. Don't give up. He's going to deal well with you. Thou hast dealt well with thy servant, O Lord, according to thy word. Hasn't he promised to do so? According to thy word, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. Now, verse 66 gives us our first hint at the answer to the question I've raised. What do you do when you're, what do you pray when you're confused? And I love verse 66, teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed, that's to trust, that's to build your life upon, that's to wholly commit yourself to, I am resting in, I am standing on your commandments. But I love the prayer of verse 66, and I pray it often. And it's really throughout the word, teach me. You know, Jesus promised us the Holy Spirit, and he said when the Comforter has come, he will remind you, he will bring to your mind and heart all the things that I've taught you and commanded you. He is our teacher. Every day, all day, we have the presence of God, the presence of the Spirit, the presence of Jesus, the presence of the Father with us, and he's a teacher. I love that, just that picture, that I'm not doing life alone. I'm not facing my problems or my challenges or my hardships alone. How often do we go it alone? We try it alone. We try to escape or resolve or get out of things. And in reality, um, God's there the whole time, waiting to be relied on, waiting for us to cast our cares on him, put it in his hands, waiting for us to pray a prayer, something like this. Lord, I don't know what to do here. Could you teach me? Could you teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I have believed thy commandments. This is a great prayer. You know, every problem that you look at in your life, every challenge, every affliction, every difficulty, through the eyes of God, it's not a problem. He never had a problem. He already knows the solution. He already knows the outcomes. He knows the outcomes of every possible option that you have. He knows the right way through. He knows the right path, how to respond, how to deal with it. And he and he's ready to guide you. Uh, He is ready to teach you. He's ready to light your path up and to lead you forward, to give you a straight path, uh, to direct your steps. He is ready. If you'll lean not to your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. If you're willing to say, Lord, teach me. So this is just a simple thing, but it is so powerful. And I don't know uh, where you are in terms of your particular circumstances. Maybe I'm speaking to someone that's dealing with a health trial or a family uh, conflict. Maybe I'm uh, talking to a young dad who's leading his family to follow Jesus and you know you've got pressures and problems and bills and so much weighing down on you. And this is the prayer. This is what you pray when you're confused. God, I'm confused. This is murky. This is foggy. This is difficult. Teach me. Would you teach me good judgment and knowledge? Lord, I, I need to know what I need to know, and I need discernment, judgment. I need wisdom. James 1 says he gives liberally, he gives wisdom liberally to anyone that will ask. I just love this. And God has just never failed me. I mean, I'm 55 and I've got 47 years of following Jesus and 35 years of ministry leadership and 12 of that as a senior pastor. And I have come into thousands of moments where I am perplexed and don't know what to do, whether it's in marriage or family, parenting, whether it's in pastoring, leading a church or school, uh, whether it's in budgeting or hiring or all the moving pieces of an organization like Emmanuel, it um, it is a challenge and it is often overwhelming. And this prayer saves me every time. Lord, teach me this, I'm yours, I'm your child. This is your family. This is your school. This is your church. Lord, teach me good judgment, for I believed thy commandments. I'm putting my trust, my whole my whole uh, faith and reliance is on your commandments. Well, let's move on to verse 67. 
Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. I want you to think about that. The affliction, and he's going to come back to the idea of affliction, but the affliction followed a time of sin. That's what the word astray means. This this psalmist gives us such hope because here we are looking at the preserved word of God, an author that God chose to pen his words and preserve those words for all of uh, posterity. And here we are thousands and thousands of years later reading these words, and we're reading about grace. We're reading about a man who failed, or a, an author, a psalmist who failed, who walked away, who fell away. Now, again, I don't know your story. There are hundreds and even thousands of you that are, that are tracking along with the channel. I don't know your story, but I know that everyone that's watching this video at some time or another in their life, they've gone astray. So we serve the God of grace. We serve a God of mercy. And all that mercy was made available through Jesus on the cross. And that's where we see the gospel embedded into scriptures like this, even though it's Old Testament, even though it's an ancient psalm. The principles of the gospel here are we fail. God never fails, but we do. We sin, we falter, we break his commands, we backslide, we wander, we go astray. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, the psalm, or the song says. So the psalmist says, I did, I went astray and I was afflicted. Verse 67, before I was afflicted. So I was afflicted. Now, was this affliction a result of going astray? Quite possibly, it could have been. But not all affliction, this is so important for you theologically to understand this. Not all affliction has a straight line to sin in our lives, okay? Some does, some does not. Jesus said in the world, you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. So uh, uh, affliction, you know, if I stick my finger into a fire or a light socket, I can't, if I get electrocuted or burned, I can't say, well, it's the judgment of God. No, God's punishing me. No, that's just the natural results of doing something foolish or stupid, okay? So the psalmist says, yeah, I did go astray, and there was affliction that came out of it. You know, the greatest affliction of being astray from God is just that, that division, that canyon, that separation, that sense that you're not walking closely with God and that you know this is going to go no place good. But here's the beautiful thing. Number one, when God allows affliction in our lives as his children, and once we're saved, he's not simply punishing us. In fact, he's not punishing us. Punishment, the root word punishment, pun, punitive, punishment implies you're paying for your crimes, okay? So to the degree that punishment means, in a modern vernacular, okay, and I'm not getting into the etymology and all the nuances, I'm just simply drawing a point, to the degree that punishment means paying for my sin, God never punishes us, okay? Okay. Now, if you've got a different definition for punish, that's fine. But here's my point. Jesus paid for my sins on the cross. He didn't make a partial payment. He didn't pay for some of them, or he didn't pay a little bit. He paid it all. Jesus paid it all, okay? So Jesus is the full payment. That's what the word propitiation means. That's why Jesus cried, it is finished. The work was done. He made a full payment for my sins. There is no sin. In my life, after salvation, there's no sin left to pay for. Because when I sin, 1 John 2 says, I have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. So there's no sin to be punished in my life once I've trusted Jesus or once you've trusted Jesus. Now, if you never trusted him, the price for sin is still on your head. You need to get that off your head and onto the cross by trusting, by receiving the work that Jesus did for you, by becoming your sacrifice, by dying your death and rising again to conquer death and give you his life and his forgiveness and grace. So the affliction that comes into my life is never punishment, but it is, and it does always have a chastening effect. Every kind of hardship, every kind of discomfort in life is use of God to work good things in my life, to bring about good fruit, to grow me up in grace, to fashion and form me, to bear the fruit of the Spirit. 
Uh, no chastening seems to be joyous, Hebrews says, but afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness. So affliction in this life for the child of God is never punitive. It's never a penalty for our sin. And the reason that can be a head game is we can always think of the last thing we did wrong and think, okay, well, this flat tire or this health diagnosis or this hardship is because I let God down. God's not that petty. God is not that cheap. His love is constant for you, okay? His love is steadfast. You are the object of his grace and mercy if you are in Christ. And that is unchanging. It's unwavering. It doesn't go up and down. On your good days and bad days, you are loved equally. You are favored equally. You are blessed and and cherished and graced and given mercy equally at your worst as you are at your best. The Christian journey of following God through Jesus, knowing Jesus is not be is not performance based. It is grace based. It is gospel based, and the gospel is good news, not good advice. It's good news about what Jesus has done for you, not what you do for yourself to earn His love or do for Him to earn His favor. No, it all begins. We love Him because He first loved us. So, my friend, this is so so critical. There's so much bad theology out there. There's so much bad uninformed Christianity that turns God into karma. Karma is an impersonal force that gives you what you deserve. In in the system of karma, you simply get what you deserve. It's cold, it's unloving, it's it's uncaring, it is brutal. So if anything bad happens, if you see somebody with an ailment, if you see somebody with a disability, if somebody dies tragically, anybody that believes in karma would say, well, they deserve it. They got what they deserve because that's how karma operates. The gospel is the exact opposite. First of all, God is not karma. He is a noble, highest being of the universe with personhood, with love, with grace. He wants to know us and have a relationship with us. So he's not impersonal. He's not just some intangible, ethereal force. Secondly, the whole message of the gospel is he doesn't want to give me what I deserve. He wants to grace me with what I could never deserve. And when I receive Jesus as Savior, he absorbs my sin and graces me with his love. And I could never deserve that. So it's the opposite of karma. So don't think when something bad happened to you, you you, you made God angry. That's not how it works. He's not an angry stepparent. He is uh, He's not the headmaster of an orphanage. He is a loving father who, if he allows discomfort in your life, it is in the most loving of intentions And with the greatest of outcomes, and when it's all said and done, if you trust him, you're going to say, you've dealt well with me. In the big picture, you've dealt well with me. And one day, you're going to call the present affliction a light affliction because you're going to see a far more and exceeding and a great and eternal weight of glory. And it's going to swallow up all the little burdens and afflictions, all the much smaller burdens and afflictions of this life that feel so big right now. So before I was afflicted, I went astray. It's a terrible thing to be astray. But sometimes God uses affliction to get our attention and draw us back, to bring us back to safety. But now have I kept thy word. So conversion, confession, repentance. I went astray, but I came home. And I just got to tell you, my friend, verse 67 is awesome because it means God wants you back. That's the whole definition of mercy and grace. That's the whole heart of God. When you go astray, it's not that you lose your salvation, but you do have a relational distance or gap with God. You haven't been disowned. You are secure. Your eternity is secure in Jesus. That's not questioned. But you can always turn back in repentance and come home and be restored in that sweet, close fellowship. You say, but Carrie, you don't know what I've done. But God does, and he loves you no no less. You say, well, you don't know how far I've wandered. Uh, Well, God does, and I can tell you what, you are, he is right behind you, and his arms are extended, and uh, and, and he's, you're one turn away from getting right back where you, you, you want to be and right back where he wants you to be. It's, it's not even a very far journey back home. His arms are right behind you. He is following with you. You've never gotten too far from him, even though you might feel like you've gone far astray. That's just an emotion. God's ready to receive you back. So make the decision. Maybe this whole video is coming to you because he wants you to come home. And you can say, okay, God, I'm coming home. I'm going to keep your word. I'm going to get back into your word. I'm going to keep your word. Let's look at verse 68. Thou art good and doest good. Teach me thy statutes. Two phrases. Thou art good and doest good. I just love that because it's so foundational. 
It's so fundamental to everything. It, it needs to be woven indelibly. I, I think that's why this phrase is in this song, because the, the lie of Satan from the garden all the way forward to now is that God is not good, that somehow he's holding back on us, that somehow we're not getting his best, that somehow um, he, is, he is malicious. And this verse just silences those accusations. God is good. He is perfectly good. He is comprehensively good. This is what it means to be holy. He is absolutely, eternally, infinitely good. Always has been, always will be. He only does good. So if you see bad happening, that you can blame Satan, you can blame blame sin, you can blame our sin natures, you can blame fallen creation, fallen humanity, you can blame the, the fallen angel demons that are doing the work of Satan all over the world, but don't blame God. Satan wants to blame God. No, he is good and he does good. He is doing good. He will do good. He is consuming his good plan for all of redemptive history, all of creation. And so here it is again, this prayer, teach me thy statutes. God, you're good. I'm weak. I go astray. I'm confused. I'm afflicted. Lord, teach me, show me your principles, show me your path. I want to get it right. So much of life, I mean, this just speaks so deeply to me because as I follow the Lord, it's just this, I feel like I'm tripping along. I feel like I'm limping along, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling forward and praise God, it's a grace struggle and it's a forward struggle. And over the journey, it's like, Lord, just teach, just keep teaching me. Don't give up on me keep teaching me and my continued prayer, whether as a husband or a dad or a papa or a pastor, when so often I get it wrong is I want to get it right. I want to get it right. So Lord, teach me. And that's what I see the psalmist praying right now. Teach me thy statutes. Lord, I want to get this right. Verse 69, we have four more verses. I got to pick up the pace here. Verse 69, the proud, the arrogant, the evil, the ungodly, okay, have forged a lie against me. Has that ever happened to you? Man, that is a terrible experience. When someone has crafted a lie and is propagating and publishing that lie, and you know it's not true, and those who know you know it's not true, but you don't have any power to change the narrative. Oh, that's so difficult. The proud have forged a lie against me. So what's the response? And by the way, that brings a lot of confusion to tie in with our title today perplexity. How do I fix this? How do I save my reputation? How do I correct the record? How do I defend myself? Well, let's see what the psalmist did to defend himself against the lie that the proud forged against him. But I will, okay, here it is, drum roll. What's he going to do? I will keep thy precepts with my whole heart. (laughs) In other words, I'm not going to chase the correction of the lie and self-justifying and self I'm not going to get consumed in a human battle. I am going to keep your precepts. I'm going to hold on to you with my whole heart. God, I'm trusting you. I'm following you. I'm walking in your way and in your word, and you're going to have to correct the record. I love that. Verse 70, their heart, whose heart? The proud, the arrogant, the evil, the ungodly. Their heart, I love this phrase, is as fat as grease, but I delight in thy law. What in the world does the term as fat as grease mean, okay? Well, fat means full or thick, and grease means fat, (laughs) okay? So again, uh, the word fat, we don't quite use it this way in our modern vernacular, but the idea is um, thick-headed fat, Okay, thick headed lard. Have you ever heard that phrase? uh, You're as dumb as a bucket of lard. That's, I think, an old Southern phrase, you know, that that phrase came from this verse. I have no doubt in my mind because that's what it's saying. Uh, They're the the idea of being fat uh, um, literally is like a thick slab of fat, thick. Okay, dense. The 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 um, metaphor, the metaphorical idea is stupid, all right, dumb. And so so the psalmist in preserved scripture is saying proud, arrogant, ungodly people are as dumb as a bucket of grease. 
they're as dumb as a bucket of Crisco. They're as dumb as fat. Yeah, I mean that that's that's that is so great. Their heart is as fat as grease, as dumb as fat. <clears throat> but I delight. But I here's the counter view. You want to be brilliant. You want to be smart. You want to learn, you want to have judgment, you want to have knowledge. Here it is. I delight in thy law. The laws of God order the universe. The laws of God are how life works. And when you embed your heart in learning and growing and walking in the laws of God, these people, verse 69 and 70, end up just thinking you're lucky, that you just happened into blessing. No, there's blessings built in to just living life the way God designed it to be lived. It's it's like using fire, how it's designed to be used instead of burning your hand with it or using an electrical outlet for how it's designed to be used instead of electrocuting yourself. Uh, In today's culture, we'd rather figure out uh, a medication to keep electricity from electrocuting us and so we can continue to 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 misuse electricity. That's the way, you know, we're going to do what we want to do and we'll rewire God's creation and when that hurts us and destroys us and is destructive, we'll just look for a cure. That's that's the wrong way to go about life. No, this psalmist says, I'm not going to do life stupidly. Verse 7 is the proud are all about their agendas, all about their false narratives, all about their own plans. I I'm going to be smarter than that. Verse 70, I'm not going to be that dumb. I'm going to get into God's law. I'm going to walk God's ways. I'm going to let his word shape me and guide me and direct me. Now look at verse 71, because this is kind of the high moment of these eight verses, I think. Now remember verse 67, he said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. So we've dealt with affliction, but now look what he says about affliction. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. Now think about that. That is really hard to see or feel or imagine on the front side of affliction or in the middle of affliction. If you're going through that, it's really hard for you to to get a sense of verse 71. It's good for me that I've been afflicted. Um, It's hard to say that in the middle of it. I know when I've gone through affliction, I don't like to say, oh, it's good for me. You know, I'm going to take this, I'm going to go through this uh, because this is good for me. No, it's painful, it's hard, it's sorrowful, it's grievous, it's it's heavy, it's depressing. I mean, affliction is really hard. But when you follow a, a, an omniscient, omnipotent God who is good and doing good things, verse 68, you can trust that one day you're going to say, you've dealt well with your ser- servant, verse 65. And so there's going to be a moment like verse 65, if you follow God through the affliction, there's going to be a moment where you're going to say, it was good for me. It was good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Now, many of you know, um, 12 or 13 years ago, I had a one-year battle with cancer. And uh, I talk about it a lot. People that hear me teach probably get tired of me talking about it. But it was too formational not to talk about. And it was, and there were other times of affliction in my life, but that was a redefining moment in, in profound ways. And I look back on that and I say it often, it was good for me to be afflicted in that way. It was wonderfully good. The, the, the biggest and most astounding and wonderful blessings of my life have come directly out of that journey through cancer. Now, when I was in the middle of it, boy, I couldn't see it. I wondered what God was doing. But I did believe, I chose to believe at some point, I'd come across scriptures like this, and they would reframe me, they'd rewire me, they would embed into my heart hey, this is going to turn out for good. He's going to deal well with you. He does good. He is good. He does good things. He's teaching you. He's shaping you. You're learning. You're growing. He is making you and preparing you for what is next in your life. And the final verse, verse 72, the law of thy mouth is better unto me than thousands of gold and silver. So let's paraphrase it. God's word and God's truth and building your life on his framework of reality is better than being a billionaire. It's better than being a multimillionaire. We need resources. We need to pay our bills and buy food. We need to, we need to sustain ourselves, but the love of money will destroy us. But the love of God's word will only bless and bolster and strengthen us and make us vastly wealthy in ways that money can never, never buy. Well, these are eight rich verses. And to answer the question in the title, what do you pray when you're confused? You pray, Lord, teach me. 
Teach me good judgment. Teach me knowledge. Teach me your statutes. Lord, give me your perspective. Give me your guidance. Give me your wisdom. That's a prayer that God will always answer. Well, friends, I'm thankful you joined me today for Growing in the Gospel. I would love to read your responses and comments. And I pray that today helped you understand how to have a biblical perspective on your affliction and helped you know what to pray when you are confused. So we're going to pick it up here in verse 73 tomorrow. Have a great day. I'm praying for you all. We'll see you tomorrow.